Thank you very much for that, Heike. Uh, and I'll uh, assume that everyone can hear me um, and see my screen. So um, I'd like to thank Jane, uh, Matthew, Tom, and the team at, uh, at ANFF for the opportunity to speak to you today about a, an amazing project that was uh, a collaborative project between the University of Wollongong and ANSTO uh, that was supported uh, by the great work um, available to us here uh, at the University of Wollongong through ANFF Materials Node. Um, so, uh, just very quickly, for those, those of you that don't know about ANSTO, ANSTO is the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Uh, they operate much of Australia's landmark infrastructure, uh, including one of the world's most modern nuclear reactors, uh, modern nuclear research reactors, OPAL, up at their Lucas Heights facility. And the team uh, there at the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering, ACNS, uh, was, the, was the main group that we were working with on this collaborative project between the University of Wollongong and ANSTO. Um, from the University of Wollongong side, uh, we had involved uh, TRICEP, the Translational Research Initiative for Cellular, Eng Cellular Engineering and Printing, uh, supported by AMP Materials, uh, and also the Institute for Superconducting and Electronic Materials and the Intelligent Polymer Research Institute. So a number of really great research uh, groups uh, came together um, to, to address this, uh, this great research um, project. But of course, projects aren't done by organisations, they're done by people. So I just want to take uh, a quick moment to, to acknowledge the team uh, that, that uh, did all the work that uh, I'm going to be presenting on, on behalf of them today. So Kiralee and the team up at ANSTO, uh, and also the team down here at the University of Wollongong, particularly noting uh, many of you will know Peter Innes, Stephen Byrne and uh, Ben Filippi from the ANFF materials node here at the University of Wollongong. Um, so these are these I'm presenting on behalf of, of this great team. So as I said, this was a collaborative research project that came out of a, a seed funding uh, opportunity between the University of Wollongong and ANSTO. And uh, you know, it, it's really about sort of starting uh, new opportunities, looking in uh, new directions, uh, new research directions. Uh, and so what we came up with as a question was, can the structures and materials made possible by additive manufacturing enable novel solutions for neutron radiation environments? So there's a lot of terms in there or you know there's a lot of uh, concepts in there that I'll just go through quickly so uh, I won't labor the point here too much because I'm sure many of you uh, are much more experienced than I in additive manufacturing however you know what we were looking at really is a suite of, uh, of tools of techniques of processes that you know allow for novel structures and new materials and different materials to be used than subtractive manufacturing or traditional manufacturing techniques so there's you know, all of these amazing technologies that, you know, open the doors for, uh, for, for this sort of man manufacturing, you know, uh, new structures uh, within new materials. And that was really what we uh, were focusing in on with the, with the help of our colleagues from AMF Materials. Neutron radiation environments, perhaps uh, not quite as, uh, you know, everyone here isn't quite as au fait with those. Uh, and you know there are the sort of the, the the ones that you might think of straight away like reactors but there are also many other environments such as in space where there is uh you know a lot of neutron activity and you know you might need to be uh to be shielding or or um, moving those neutrons away from for example from uh you know space uh flight you know from sensitive electronics or sensitive people uh inside space uh, you know, ships. So, you know, not only are these materials and these structures and, you know, this research that we were doing relevant for, you know, the, what's right in front of us at ANTS though, but also, you know, some of these larger uh, space-based applications, for example, which is particularly uh, relevant to Australia and timely for Australia now. Uh, and then, you know, what materials, what are the, what are the fundamental materials that we're looking at? Um, and so there are three major uh, materials that uh, interact with neutrons. So boron uh, is typically used as a neutron shielding uh, material. So it's very good at stopping neutrons, at absorbing neutrons. Uh, hydrogen is also pretty good at, uh, at shielding, but instead of stopping the neutrons, it tends to spray them out in, in incoherent scattering ways. So um, although that can be useful in some applications for things like sample environments, Hydrogen is actually a real problem for our colleagues up in ANSTO. Uh, you know, it tends to, to make their, uh, their images much more uh, noisy. So something that we wanted to actually move away from uh, hydrogen in these uh, materials in these sample environments, as opposed to boron, where we want to see how we can actually put it in there or how we can make structures with boron in it. And the last material that was really of interest to our colleagues at ANSTO 
uh, was aluminium because that's what they use for a lot of their um, uh, you know, sample environments at the moment. Uh, it's, not a fan, you know, it's not fantastic in that it does interact with neutrons, but it interacts with neutrons in a way that they understand very, very well. And so they can use those materials and then sub subtract those, uh, you know, the effects of those materials out of, their, uh, out of their experiments. And so what we did is we took that sort of, you know, we've, we've got our umbrella idea of, you know, what, what can we do? What are these materials and additive manufacturing processes? What can they uh, give us? And we split those ideas into three different things based on those materials that I was speaking about. So polymers for neutron shielding and col collimation. Uh, low hydrogen polymers for neutron sample environments, and then metals and alloys for neutron sample environments as well. And so I don't really want to get into the sort of the nuts and bolts of the science here uh, too much, but rather say, uh, you know, rather give a good idea of just how, uh, you know, the ANTH materials node and the capability um, that was brought to us, uh, you know, in, in that, from our colleagues in that node really allowed us to attack these problems and come up with some really interesting solutions. But very quickly, um, polymers for neutron shielding and collimation. It just so happened, um, we were very lucky that uh, one of our colleagues at the University of Wollongong in the Intelligent Polymer Research Institute had just been uh, working on her PhD in boron nitride polyurethane composites. And she'd actually made 3D printable filaments from these, uh, from these composites. So we were able to take that material straight away, uh, not 3D print it in the first instance, but instead just heat press it to um, to, to uh, get our samples into the neutron radiation environments up at Anstow as quickly as possible. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the process that we did. We, we took those filaments, uh, heat pressed them, put them into a, uh, a custom mount, and actually we were able to get these in the beam, uh, in the neutron beam up at Anstow quite quickly. And, you know, as, as we had hoped and anticipated, these boron polymer uh, composites uh, gave us some great uh, neutron shielding results. So you can see on the, the left-hand plot here that we've gone from neat polyurethane, so no boron in the polyurethane at all, uh, all the way down as we put more and more polyurethane in, our transmission goes down and down and down, which is exactly what we want um, over a great range of uh, energies um, for those neutrons. So, I mean, that was our real sort of reality check or, you know, uh, that was a great way to get off the, you know, off the starting box and show that these materials uh, were you know useful for the uh, neutron shielding applications, but then uh, where you know our colleagues from Anth Materials really sort of hit it out of the park was being able to then turn that around and start to 3D print these materials. So you can see here that these are some of the 3D printed uh, components and the actual 3D printer and and the filament um, you can see here coming out of the printer. So this is our bor boron nitride polymer um, filament and the the components that are being printed straight away. So you know, this real rapid uh, ability for us to, to uh, manufacture these materials, to take these promising looking materials and then start to manufacture actual components um, was, was a real uh, benefit to allow that uh, quick uh, pro progression of the project. Now, mindful of time, I'll, I'll, I'll go quite quickly through the other two um, themes. But basically, as I said before, low hydrogen polymers um, are fantastic for sample mounts and for things where you actually want to be as neutron transparent as process so as possible. So we followed the similar process uh, in terms of heat pressing and and just getting these filaments that's commercially available, uh, a commercially available filament, getting that in the beam and seeing whether this material will actually work or not. And we did, and you can see here we've got some some results where uh, you know the FEP FEP uh, was one of the materials that we found that is very very low hydrogen, uh, and it provided a great sort of, uh, you know, yep, that's, that's good, let's give it a go. One of the problems was though, that it's very, very, very difficult to print this material. And again, uh, all, all credit to particularly Ben Filippi from uh, ANFF Materials. Uh, he actually went out and built a printer uh, that allowed us to print this material. So very high uh, temperatures, you know, really quite a difficult material to print. Uh, you know, it, it has the potential to give off hydrogen fluoride gas. So you know, very, very difficult uh, sort of sandbox that we gave Ben to, uh, to, you know, to actually start to produce components out of this material. Uh, and as you can see here along the bottom, uh, they've really knocked it out of the park and we're actually able to print very, 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 um, you know, fine uh, features in this uh, material. And if it's not the first FET printer in the world, I'd say it's very, very close to, you know, um, a very unique capability 
um, that has come out of this project and out of the expertise available to us from ANTH materials. Um, finally, um, very quickly, so uh, the last itch to scratch from our colleagues up at ANTH though was really uh, metal uh, printing. So they have these sample cans, you can see here in the, this image in the middle, uh, it's a can in which they put some of their samples, you know, a couple of milligrams of material, and then that's used as a sample mount um, in, the, in um, some of their experiments. These are subtractively manufactured out of aluminium. They're very expensive because they're very tight tolerances and they're very thin walled components. And so, you know, often they'll have to clean them out because, you know, you can't just use them and then throw them away. And that was a real pain point um, for a lot of the experiments that our colleagues at ANSO were, were doing. And so what we were able to do, again, with the, the capability available to us at ANTH Materials, uh, was to 3D print these um, components like for like and start to really show uh, what the capability of additive manufacturing in the metal additive manufacturing space is. And you can see here um, down in the bottom right, um, so we've got a, a, the insert for the right hand side is the traditionally manufactured insert made out of aluminium. Uh, and on the left hand side here is a 3D printed titanium um, like for like comparison. And the, you know, the, the capability in terms of thin walled structures, in terms of uh, being able to print exactly the, the component we're after was a real benefit uh, to open the, you know, this as a, as a um, great chance to now say to answer, well, we can do it uh, like for like. Now, if you had a clean sheet of paper, what would your sample uh, environments look like? What would your sample holders look like? Would you really like something that's a lot more complex in geometry um, that you just simply have never been had the access to because of subtractive manufacturing limitations? So with that, I'll, I'll finish very quickly with, you know, this is the question that we set out to answer. You know, can the structures and materials made possible by additive manufacturing enable novel solutions for neutron, neutron radiation environments? And I hope that in my very short time today, I've, uh, I've convinced you that yes, the answer is yes. Uh, but what next? And I think that's something that hopefully, you know, we've had, so I gave a presentation very similar to this uh, to some colleagues from Ansto, and already, uh, you know, we've had some great engagement. You know, it's not uh, not because I'm a good stand-up comedian, but because the the outcomes of this uh, project already has, you know, started the wheels turning for a number of different colleagues from uh, different groups completely uh, across Ansto. So, uh, you know, that's really shown the the value that this technique and the capability uh, has given in terms of opening the door for, uh, you know, additive manufacturing in neutron radiation environments. So I'll finish there, thank the team again, and uh, invite any questions, or if anyone likes, would like to get in contact and, and speak, with, uh, speak with me about this more, I'd, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. We have one question from Sean Langelier. How was the boron impregnated in the polyurethane? So that was actually a, uh, a, um, a manual mixing technique. So the, the polyurethane was, um, was suspended in a uh, solvent and then the boron nanopowder was actually mixed into that and then uh, the, the solvent was uh, allowed to escape and then that was turned into a filament there. So it was quite a, uh, a homogenous um, uh, distribution of boron nitride throughout the polyurethane composite matrix. But Thank certainly you. Uh, Peter Innes uh, from Anth Materials, uh, that was his PhD student that was doing it. So he uh, is certainly uh, much more experienced uh, than I to answer that question. If you have any, uh, you know, sort of really technical uh, questions about that, I'm sure Peter would love to um, answer that. Thanks, Jonathan.